Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the third and final session of the day. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the day so far. Um, just before we get started, uh, I just wanted to reiterate the message that machine learning science focus is shoot and run, and a lot of us are coming to the end of our PhD. So if you know anybody who would be interested in helping us run this organization for the coming years, then uh, please let us know. Thank you for letting us know. Or encourage them to get in touch with us. Um, we're going to on a PhD student. Um, okay, so I think I really that. Um, so our, our next uh, final uh, keynote talk uh, is from Dr. Mikhail Dussel, uh, who's from the, uh, he's a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Spain. And uh, this talk will be a mixture of uh, computer science and, and neuroscience. Um, so, uh, I'll let you take a look. Thank you, Jack, and uh, thanks for the invitation and the very nice presentation. Uh, it's really exciting to, to, to have this talk actually, like, like applying machine learning to different fields. Uh, so, this talk is going to be about uh, some thoughts that I gather uh, on the interaction between machine learning and basic science. Um, so essentially, uh, I've been working quite a bit uh, in particular with the neuroscientists that try to understand different mechanisms, uh, brain mechanisms. And uh, yeah, sometimes like uh, I experienced that it's quite challenging somehow to combine uh, research in machine learning uh, we uh, research in basic science, and I think there there's a fundamental reason for that is that um, the it's essentially about like different things. Although you might say you can start in a similar way because in experimental science it's a lot about designing experiments and getting data, which is high dimensional, which is structured heterogeneous many times. And of course, like it looks like machine learning uh, is a big, very good quanti uh, candidate to address uh, questions about this data because it's about designing learning algorithms that are well uh, suited to high dimensional data structure heterogeneous. Um, however, uh, there's a difference about uh, how we consider this, in which framework we consider this data. Uh, so in basic science, you consider data to infer mechanisms. Uh, typical question that you can ask, for example, in your science is for the visual system detect edges. Okay, it's about the mechanism of detection. But even like more general questions uh, can be formulated in a sense in terms of underlying mechanisms. For example, why do we sleep? Is uh, typically a question that turns out to be framed into uh, can I find the mechanisms that occur during sleep and uh, that achieve a particular outcome? In contrast, if you look at machine learning, uh, typically the algorithms are aimed to optimize the predefined laws, zero one laws for classification, least square. Uh, they are made to feed the data uh, to infer some posterior distributions within a prior. So, um, yeah, clearly, like here, the goals are very different. Uh, and then, how to essentially frame these questions relies heavily on theory in basic science. And this theory is essentially at best developed through mechanistic models. For example, we have the other option, uh, biophysical model of uh, neuron functions. And uh, we have models also of uh, how do we measure essentially neural data, which are which are actually also biophysical. Uh, so in contrast, uh, in machine learning also we reason on models, but typically we reason on statistical and probabilistic models. So uh, yeah, I try to gather essentially some thoughts and some experiences for on how to combine the two, and I start with. Uh, the classic approach, I would say, which uh, I call it you know, ML guided scientific discovery, and with an example. So essentially, a lot of our work 
is interested in uh, episodic memory. Episodic memory is essentially or when you remember when you put your keys in scrolling. Uh, so you have essentially emerging some memories, sensory memories, uh, memory of places uh, that are encoded by place cells uh, in, the, in the hippocampus. And essentially, there have been uh, theories and how these memories are built and consolidated, and they rely on the interaction between two structures, the neocortex, which is essentially the big part of the cortex, uh, the top of the cortex uh, in human, and uh, the hippocampus, which is a smaller structure uh, that is present not only in human, but for example, in rodents. Uh, that are studied a lot in this context. Uh, and this structure looks indeed like a hippocampus. So, uh, essentially, this process of uh, memory, uh, episodic memory for information, is assumed to uh, be um, um, so in several stages. So, the first is encoding. During your experience, the developer cortex sends the information to the hippocampus. And uh, during the night, typically, but also uh, during wakefulness when you get a reward, the hippocampus sends also some information to the neocortex uh, in order to con consolidate these memories. And uh, this process also happens during sleep. And uh, essentially, once you have uh, made several loops uh, of this process, uh, information that has been encoding temporarily in the hippocampus uh, during awake experience is transferred to the neocortex and at some point actually you can even uh, retrieve memories even without the hippocampus, the hippocampus. but the uh, hippocampus might still play, play a role in the at the knowledge stage so uh oh, and uh, so, um, the hippocampus, if you look at the section of it, is divided in very clear uh, subfields. And these subfields essentially they are connected uh, to each other with relatively straightforward connections. So, it's a very nice subsystem in order to study, for example, uh, causal interactions between uh, brain structures. And then we come back to it. But uh, essentially, uh, what's uh, very interesting is that during the trivial of a memory, what happens in uh, one subfield of the hippocampus, that is TA1, that sends information to cortex, is uh, that uh, populations of neurons that encode the particular memory uh, spike together and synchronize. Uh, here, for example, uh, this is a spiking of neurons that encode particular location on the track. Uh, so this is the experience, uh, the, the spikes reflecting, uh, reflecting the experience during uh, <clears throat> wakefulness. And what happens is uh, before uh, the, the, the rat goes to this track with some objective to get some reward at the end, uh, has to remember essentially uh, what it has to do. And you have this uh, replay that essentially uh, gathers like Spiking activity associated to the experience that he's going to experience in the future because he already knows his track. And at the end uh, of the track, when he gets the reward, has another replay that essentially uh, allows him to uh, encode uh, the fact that due to these actions, uh, he got his reward. So it's uh, about credit assigned to some extent. <clears throat> so uh, we can uh, study essentially these events based on electrophysiology data, so not only spiking activity, but what we call local field potential, which is like a microscopic electrical activity we can record with, uh, with electrodes. And uh, a signature of this replay is a very high frequency oscillation, around 200 Hertz in the neural data. So this is a little bit of context uh, to, uh, to tell you, like typically to give you an example of uh, the way to use machine learning classically uh, when interacting with experimentalists. Essentially, uh, it's a uh, they have an explorer theory phase, and for that, like clustering algorithm are very nice because 
you just take some data and you think, okay, maybe there's something interesting to see in the data. Let me try and supervise learning. And uh, we do some clustering. So here we take like those uh, traces in uh, electrode recordings in the hippocampus as uh, that are associated to uh, the onset of this uh, sharp wave ripple oscillation that comprises high frequency oscillations, but also low frequency oscillation. We cluster this data, this data set for different events that we record, different ripple events. And uh, typically at this stage, you struggle a bit to get something that, uh, that, uh, that is significant, that makes sense. Uh, so you, you want to get some clusters, but of course it's very high dimensional data. Uh, so not necessarily like the best clustering algorithm according to the literature works. Uh, here uh, we use a, a form of coordinate map, which essentially you know, fits uh, this two dimensional array to uh, this high dimensional space. In the second stage, uh, once we have this two dimensional array that, you know, you have this grid point essentially that are uh, essentially clusters, but micro clusters, you can after uh, cluster again those micro clusters to get in the end like four different subtypes of sharp wave ripples. Uh, so now essentially, uh, We have done our job with machine learning. Maybe there's not so many, so much better. Okay. Uh, let's go. No. Okay. Let me try. Yeah, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's the battery now. It's not the thing with the mouse either. Okay, if you switch to the next slide. Uh, Let me try. No. Let's exit the switch. Yeah, just exit. Yeah. All right, so I, I just continue go on a bit to like summarizing this. Uh, once you have done you have done this job, uh, once you have done this job, essentially you have done uh, your machine learning path, but you're just halfway or less than halfway to get a result in your science. Because what does it mean in the case cluster? We don't know. Because. So the rest of uh, the rest of the work is to uh, interpret essentially uh, what the difference between these clusters. So this, for example, we can do by uh, concurrently recording, like electrophysiology recordings, so electrical recordings that I showed before, with uh, functional uh, magnetic resonance imaging in uh, a way uh, in, uh, in in one case. And uh, you can trigger essentially the fMRI response in the whole brain uh, with respect to uh, those events that you have detected, the different subtypes. And the, the benefit of this is essentially what you're going to have is like a very local measure of what happens in a particular structure involved in memory and brain wide uh, activity with much less uh, temporal resolution. But that gives you essentially a summary of what happens in terms of interaction in the whole brain when you remember something. Uh, so uh, this is the kind of maps that you can get from that, uh, where you have essentially a response in some regions that are uh, going up, for example, in the cortex, and some response in some cortical structure that are going down. So you can essentially uh, map the response in the whole brain, and you can look at the differences between the activation, so this is no time with respect to the event onset, uh, the activation in different structures. And what you observe is essentially a cortical activity is going up, but the strength essentially of the activation of neocortex uh, depends on the subtypes, and also uh, the strength of the deactivation on some particular subcortical structure 
especially what we call neuromediated structure that control the state of the brain, are also modulated differently depending on the subject. So essentially, that allows us to draw conclusion essentially from, from, from this analysis, this initial clustering analysis, and interpret the result. And the type of interpretation that we drew, for example, here, is that uh, neuromodulatory activity that controls the state of the brain uh, can modify the microcircuit dynamics of the circuit of neurons in the C1, the recording structure C1. And uh, at the same time, uh, like for some events where you remember something, some events are triggered by neocortical activity, uh, which is typically typically something that uh, that can be observed in a wake set when you want to do retrieval of a particular memory. Yeah. So this conclusion to get this essentially it's much more work than the original clustering is. And the take home of that is that. Uh, yeah, not necessarily the most fancy machine learning algorithm would be the best to address an experimental science question, but it depends on many parameters. Most of them are elusive. Uh, you need extensive knowledge necessary to contribute the field. And uh, the reason is essentially the ability of MLM to describe and uh, convert mechanisms is typically, is typically not so clear. So now let's switch to uh, like some more integrated approach where we're going to try to connect uh, statistical models to mechanistic models that are formulated based on uh, domain knowledge. <clears throat> so here we are still looking at this oscillation in what we call local shift potential, electrical activity. And uh, we're going to look at the synchronization between these oscillations that are uh, mesoscopic activities that describe the, the the state of a particular structure in the brain uh, with underlying spiking activity of individual neurons. And there are some very interesting results showing that depending on the type of neurons you're looking at, because there are many types of neurons even in the same structure, notably there are inhibitory and excitatory neurons. So those some that activate other neurons, where some, some other are deactivated and deactivate other neurons. They are all essentially connected via like recurrent interaction, typically, <coughs> what we call micro circuits. So, depending on the type of neuron, you observe different uh, synchronization phenomena between those, those spiking activities and oscillations. And this is believed essentially, this is believed to be critical to the organization and information processing in different brain structures. Uh, so this one question is essentially like how to quantify uh, this, uh, and uh, mathematically you can quantify this by a coupling measure, for example, what we call pass blocking value. The idea is that you take an oscillation, brain oscillation, uh, you convert it to a complex uh, number time series where the phase indicates where you are in the period of the oscillation. So once you have done this, after you can look at the coupling uh, between uh, this oscillation x and the point process that is represented here by the counting process. How many spikes are there in the time in the time series of the time shift? And uh, you can make this uh, what is called so stochastic integral that essentially sums the contribution of the values of this complex uh, signal at the points where a spike occurs. And if there is synchronization, this quantity essentially is gonna be uh, polarized toward the direction in the complex plane. And this phase indicates you essentially the phase of synchronization of the oscillation with uh, the spiking activity. So uh, this is a classical measure that is used, but not necessarily like great uh, to tackle like hard problems about system neuroscience where typically the, the dynamics relied on the, on the population. And now we have the tool to record like large population of neurons and large quantities of uh, electrical activity in different channels. So we need to take advantage of this high dimensionality in order uh, to do a similar analysis in terms of like of coupling between spiking activity and uh, local field potential, but in the multivariate case. And of course, like you can think of like 
dimensionality reduction 101, in order to do that, that you could consider uh, like a very simple machine learning algorithm, uh, because it's just based on uh, observed data and their covariance, their covariation. Uh, and you can essentially take a coupling matrix that gather essentially the coupling like between all pairs of spikes and continuous signal. And you decompose it with a, a singular value decomposition. And you can approximate it by a low rank matrix, which is essentially just taking uh, the first singular value of, uh, of this matrix uh, with the, the left singular vector and the transpose of the right singular vector. And once you get this, essentially, you have like one vector that is going to summarize the activity and the synchronization of across the population of pi, and one that is summarizing the <coughs> the coupling across the population of uh, local field potential A. So you have a concise description of the coupling that is uh, more easily interpretable by us uh, scientists in order to make sense of uh, what are the conclusions that we can draw from, from this uh, measurement of the matrix C. And uh, <coughs> so, Decomposing this, uh, uh, in order to understand like how to interpret essentially this results, first of all, we have to figure out whether we can do a significant analysis of this uh, this machine learning uh, algorithm outcome, if you take it like this. Uh, for that, let's go back to one single coefficient of the matrix. Uh, so this is written as an integral, and you can use uh, what you call mapping at theory. That describe essentially uh, point processes and have the Poisson uh, processes that uh, decompose is essentially uh, the counting process into a deterministic part, where here essentially you have the instantaneous pipe pipe of the Poisson process and the stochastic part that is called the math the math angle. And you can essentially use this decomposition. You can use this decomposition in order to uh, uh, decompose the coupling measure into one deterministic part and one stochastic part. And the benefit of this is that this stochastic part here tends to a zero mean Gauge. So essentially here we have a, a estimation noise essentially uh, that goes on top of the what we want to estimate essentially the true coupling. So if you think of this, then uh, you can think that if you go to a large matrix where uh, C star here would be zero. Then you end up with just a large matrix of uh, random noise. And interestingly, you can use random matrix theory to characterize such matrices. And in particular, uh, for uh, complex Gaussian random virus sample ID for the matrix coefficients, you can uh, show that the covariance matrix uh, between like these, uh, so the, the if you, you take x is the origin of the matrix, you make x, x transpose that gives you an, an initial matrix, which is diagonalizable, and uh, you can assess the eigenvalues of this matrix. The distribution of eigenvalues when the dimension of such matrix increases converges to a particular distribution that is called the Marchenko Pastor distribution. So the largest eigenvalue that relates to the larger singular value that you want to assess uh, in your data uh, is essentially at the top of this if there is no coupling at all. So that means that you will get positive uh, singular values, but they might not be significant at all. So you can use this uh, characterization based on random matrix theory to assess the significance of empirically observed uh, coupling matrices where you essentially can uh, decompose it as a sum of ma uh, matrix that has the Martingale norms and the uh, ground truth matrix, the matrix of the ground truth coupling for which you want to uh, measure the singular vectors. And what we prove essentially is that uh, you can characterize the behavior in our setting of this matrix and, 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 and show that uh, the 
the top of the machine, machine go fast for distribution can be used as a threshold. And any uh, eigenvalues that is larger than this threshold can correspond to a significant conflict in chain when the dimension gets high. And uh, so the you can essentially check this, uh, for example, in simulation, but also with real data. But uh, here we know the ground truth. And where there is no coupling uh, between like population, those spikes, and local field potential, indeed, you get a pure Marche combat distribution. And when you add some coupling, some significant coupling, you get still this distribution, but on top of it, beyond the threshold, you have some extra uh, eigenvalues. And those correspond to significant coupling. So once we characterize, the behavior of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of this measure, uh, what you can do is essentially to apply it to data, right? And what you get is, uh, if it's significant, this larger uh, eigenvalue corresponds to a larger singular vector here, uh, you can associate it uh, to a spike vector that would describe essentially the distribution of the coupling across the population of spikes and the distribution of the coupling across the population of LFT. And if those, for example, are organized spatially, you will get a spatial map. And uh, the thing is, like, of course, still, uh, we are missing something in the sense, like, how can we interpret uh, those results? It's not clear in terms of uh, mechanism, neural mechanism. So what you can do is to parallel this approach with the same thing that we apply to a biophysical model. So you can either apply it to uh, simulations based on biophysically realistic model of the network, or you can apply it uh, analytically to an analytical model of this network. And essentially, uh, the, uh, the, the larger singular uh, values and singular vector, they're going to give you a reduced model of the activity that you can interpret in terms of uh, mechanistic uh, parameters, for example, like biophysical parameters of the neurons, but uh, importantly for us, the coupling between the different neurons. And so essentially, inference is going to be about like estimating this parameter and interpretation about like making sense of what you observe in real data based on uh, the results on the modeling. So this step is challenging, and I would say we're only scratching the surface, probably uh, in, in Brandon's uh, impressive talk, uh, I would say this is a bit easier in physics because you actually know pretty well the physics of uh, like we are much more advanced in terms of like model of uh, in, in physical science than models in, in neuroscience and biology in general. So yeah, this step is, these steps are obviously challenging, but uh, you can get some idea of what you can get from a, from from this type of analysis. Uh, so you can simulate, for example, like two different networks <coughs> that are specially distributed and that include interactions between two types of neurons, excitatory and inhibitory. Uh, one where the recurrent interactions between excitation and inhibition are, are relatively weak, and one where they are much stronger. We call this arrow uh, strong recurrent inhibition. It's uh, something that is very important, essentially, uh, to characterize the network in neuroscience. And uh, we run the analysis of uh, uh, the coupling, and we plot, essentially, a singular vector, uh, vector spike and LFP vectors. And what you can observe and here, this is a phase, essentially, that is represented, the phase of the coefficient of singular vector. This is represented spatially because the, the network is a square network. And uh, there is an input coming at the center. And you see, essentially, that there's a phase gradient uh, from the center to, uh, to, to the outside. And at the same time, there is a phase gradient. There is also a decay of the activity. So there is a stimulation coming in the middle. It propagates, and it attenuates. And at the same time, there's a phase gradient. And you see that those phase gradients, they are different for the two models. So the idea is that. Uh, based on that, you can go back to the theoretical model and figure out that uh, actually this gradient reflects uh, the amount of recurrent inhibition. And if this is flat or slightly positive, this, this is weak recurrent inhibition. And 
if this decays like this as a function of the magnitude of the activity here, then uh, this is a sign of recurrent inhibition. So uh, essentially, uh, this is a simulation, but we are called, can also use this result essentially to characterize what happens in real data. So this is data from the prefrontal cortex, where essentially you, you plot essentially the same, and you see that uh, it, con it concurs to uh, the interpretation that uh, the activity in this small piece of cortex uh, is essentially characterized by uh, strong recurrent inhibition, according to this. Event. All right, so uh, this uh, part is tell you the following, and uh, of course, like I would say, the message was uh, also conveyed in Brandon's talk uh, for a different field uh, is that, uh, so first of all, okay, the proper, synthetic properties of ML algorithm are not necessarily trivial, and they need to be characterized, for example, if uh, you uh, work in application to basic science because many times you want to uh, be able to assess significance of the outcome of such algorithm. And uh, we can discuss further about it and I will mention uh, it uh, a bit later again. <clears throat> but uh, also like what's, what's important is essentially the developing ML algorithm adapted to those mechanistic models that essentially carry the information, the domain knowledge uh, in a very uh, precise way. Uh, this is a way to ensure interpretability of the analysis through machine learning algorithm. And this is really something that we have to push, uh, and notably in neuroscience. So now I'm gonna mm, I think what, I'm, I'm gonna just shorting, uh, shorting introduce uh, one, one, one concept uh in uh, in causal machine learning uh so we have we have shown I, I i started saying like uh basic science is about mechanism but uh machine learning is not really about mechanism it's not completely true in the sense that uh, people have been interested in uh like the causal side of machine learning and uh <clears throat> in particular uh, there is this assumption that we work uh, a lot with, is this assumption of independence of causal mechanisms. Uh, the statement of this assumption is essentially uh, if you have a, a process uh, that you can decompose in uh, two different modules, uh, if you can describe these systems as, as a causal graph between subsystems, uh, this assumption conveys that the causal uh, generative process, so the data generative process, uh, if you look at system variables, it's composed of autonomous modules that do not influence, uh, inform or influence each other. So it's a, it's a modularity assumption in the sense that tells you that if you have two sub mechanisms, nature is going to pick uh, like the properties of each of those sub mechanisms independently from each other. So they don't inform each other. Uh, this is a very general statement, and it can be uh, expressed mathematically and quantitatively in different ways, depending on the context. And uh, but in a probabilistic case, yeah, typically what you would think is like the conditional distribution uh, of a variable given its cause does not enforce uh, the the rest of the the other mechanism. So an illustration of this is a visual perception. Uh, because indeed, like uh, we can we can say that this type of assumption is something that we use uh, to infer properties of the real world. And uh, take for example, like objects that are distributed in space. Uh, you can think of them as a cause, and they are uh, conveyed to your perception through a mechanism that involves essentially like the the configuration of the VUSC. And so you turn like a 3D configuration into a 2D configuration, and at the same time, your brain wants to infer what actually happens in 3D. And there is a, this assumption in, a, <clears throat> in computer vision that is called generic viewpoint assumption, that essentially is one particular statement of 
independence of mechanism in the sense that what you say is that the viewpoint is generic. So essentially, this mechanism by which you sense the outside world is not tuned to the configuration of object. So we can think of uh, cases when it fails. For example, look at this chair. Uh, well, this is not a chair. This is not a chair, but we could not infer it based on this picture because uh, the configuration of objects was fine-tuned to the point of view of the observer. So essentially, uh, this is a reasonable assumption if you assume like independence between those two mechanisms. In that case, clearly they were not independent. Uh, but it's also like conveys like what kind of assumption it is, right? And in a sense, why this assumption in general is a very valid assumption uh, to infer mechanisms from observations. So, uh, yeah, I just um, quickly talk about uh, how this assumption can be used. Uh, but I will skip the reminder of this part to go to the last part. Uh, <clears throat> here, uh, you have an application that is uh, cause effect per inference. The idea of cause effect per inference is that you observe two variables and you want to infer which of the variables is causing the other. And you have typically two choices either x causes y through mechanism m or y causes x through a mechanism m minus. And that one typical example of what we can call causal machinism, because you, you start from observation, you can learn uh, a machine learning component from data that typically is going to predict y based on x. But at the same time, you're interested in the true data generating process. And that means that you're going to make assumptions that are based on independence of mechanism in order to infer which of these or this model are uh, is the right uh, data generative mechanism. In order uh, to do that, so they're, they're depending on the frame, like uh, depending on the setting, there are different ways of how you think this. But typically, when it has in perspective, is to say, well, uh, if I take the wrong model, if I take the wrong di direction, I will observe the dependency between the parameter essentially of this mechanism and the parameter of the cause. And that's the way you can infer in many settings which one is the cause and which one is the. So there's an example of this to uh, quantify causal interactions between different structures in neuroscience. Uh, but mm, yeah, I will just uh, skip like the technical details. Uh, it's about time series analysis. And uh, yeah, essentially the message of this is that uh, independence of causal mechanism uh, can offer assumptions that have received the ground truth that are generative process. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> this formulation, the formulation of independence of causalism, of causal mechanism is domain specific. And uh, the general principles, uh, there are general principles and frameworks that exist to design them. For example, here we design a framework based on uh, what we call group invariance. And that is related also to some of the work in uh, machine learning that we equivalent. Uh, but let me go one step further. And uh, let's talk about uh, machine learning and biases in machine learning. So machine learning algorithm can perform uh, very well on complex data, but there is no free lunch. Essentially, they perform well because they, they use some inductive biases that are encoded, for example, either in the learning, uh, in the learning algorithm or in the architecture. Uh, it's not always clear uh, that we are aware of these biases. For example, there exist also implicit biases where essentially, uh, unless you study in detail like the properties of the machine learning algorithm, you're not going to see uh, the bias that are induced by the process. Uh, so this can be a curse, but we're going to see that this can also be a blessing uh, in the perspective of causal machine learning. Uh, so let's take now a problem where you have generated samples, 
uh, but you want to flip a latent variable model. So this is a classical case of what we call generative modeling, in particular deep generative models. Uh, you take a GAN, you take a VAE, variation of autoencoder, they just uh, take the data and they fit the data with a feed forward generative model. Assuming some distribution for the input latent variable. So we even assume that this distribution is factorized. So we assume the Z are IID. And uh, the function that you learn here when you when you learn to feed the data is parameterized by, by parameters theta. And the push forward uh, of this factorized distribution should be due to uh, something close to the observational distribution. Fine. So uh, there's one concern here with this model that is uh, identifiability. So if the push forward f uh, fits the data perfectly, so assume you find an f like with the parameters, the optimizing parameters that data fit the data perfectly, we say the model is identifiable if we can guarantee that it is the ground truth model. Okay, this is really the function that generated the data. Up to trivial, some trivial transformation. For example, you can always permute, right, the identity of those variables, and permuting essentially the components of the function in the same way uh, will lead to the exact same outcome. But we are not really interested in this uh, trivial undeterminacy. But uh, typically, this is this type of identifiability is challenging to obtain. Uh, <clears throat> if we can obtain them. We can do essentially causal machine learning because we have access to the ground truth latent variable by inversion, if you assume it's inver invertible. And this uh, ground truth variable, for example, can be exploited for downstream farms. They can task, they can, uh, we can anticipate what happens if some of those variable changes uh, so that we have some uh, robustness, for example, to change in the environment. So now, it has been shown that, uh, yeah, it has been shown that uh, typically, <clears throat> uh, this is not the case, this is not identifiable. And one uh, classical demonstration is the following, is that you can define uh, what is called measure preserving mind. So you can uh, bypass, like, uh, cut this connection. Instead, you go through this uh, measure preserving map and then inject in the original generative model. If you assume that the measure preserving map so we don't see it here with this, but uh, here <laughs> I think, so the idea is like the property that the push forward of P0, the original distribution uh, by, uh, yeah, it's on the minute. So the, 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 the push forward distribution of P0 leads to P0 again. So that's why we call it a measure preserving map for P0. Then of course, like there is no way you can differentiate those, those two models, right? Like, there is no way you can differentiate the model that is composed with them from the model that is not composed with it, right? So this is a classical uh, spurious solution. So if you can find always like such n, uh, then clearly, and the large family of those, for example, this is a, a case for the uniform distribution. You can apply like any kind of like a smooth rotation, like radius latent rotation to this square. This will preserve the uniform distribution of the square. So clearly, like if you compose this M with uh, some F, this will give you something very different from the original. So yeah, uh, for generic nonlinear F, there exist large families of serious solutions <coughs> such that uh, the push forward is, uh, of P0 is going to be the same. Non-identifiability. Uh, this actually has been shown originally by uh, Polyvarian uh, in the context of uh, what we call independent component analysis. Uh, showing the impossibility in general setting of non-linear independent component values because this transformation is non-linear. Uh, but this has been also like very popular, uh, such measure preserving map has been uh, exhibited also in a very popular uh, machine learning paper to show that uh, like there are some issues that are clearly unsolved in terms of representation. Uh, so let's... Uh, Let's think of the ways toward identifiability. Uh, the classical way that has been advanced, like in the last uh, in the last uh, years, is uh, through uh, replacing independent statement in the latent variable by conditional independence. 
And this typically requires multiple environments that you can identify and on which you can observe like the different conditional distribution. And this indeed like allows identifiability. Now, another way uh, that doesn't constrain your uh, to, to have multiple environments would be to constrain the model class to, uh, in a way that uh, you can roll out spurious solutions. And this is uh, some work that we have been doing uh, with independent mechanism analysis, which essentially uh, we where we constrain the F to a particular class that is called the IAB class. Uh, so there is an impact on the learning non-parametric models. Uh, essentially, uh, no maximum likelihood doesn't work uh, because the fitting the data is not enough. So you need some, some sort of constraint of regularized maximum likelihood in order to constrain the function to the normal regions. So let's see what independence of mechanism analysis is about. Uh, it's essentially about ensuring that uh, if you take the Jacobian, so you can have F a nonlinear transformation, but you impose that the columns of the Jacobian are orthogonal. This amounts to this equality between uh, essentially the log determinant of the Jacobian and the product, the sum of the logs of the norms of each of the columns. So it has a flavor, uh, it's really inspired essentially by independence of mechanism that I have saw before, in the sense that this encodes the idea that uh, the direction in which you influence the output of the function with Z1 is chosen independently to the direction uh, you uh, influence the output with Z2, like two components. Of course, this is actually not uh, not clear in two dimensions, but imagine now you have a function with very high dimensional play, the space. If you pick at random the direction of influence independently for each of the of the ground truth latent factors, there is a high probability that they end up being orthogonal. So this uh, entails in a high dimension some form of independence of mechanism uh, related to the influence of the different ground truth factors. So a typical function that uh, ensures this uh, independence is, for example, a mapping from polar coordinates to uh, to Cartesian coordinates, uh, Cartesian coordinates. So you see the original grid perpendicular for the ground truth coordinates, and it's deformed into a grid that keeps the right angle uh, between the red and the blue line. So uh, <clears throat> this can be enforced what, by uh, what we call an IMA contrast, which is essentially the difference between these two quantities. And you can show essentially this, uh, this is explained geometrically here, that this quantity is always positive. Uh, so you can use it essentially as some kind of loss that uh, you're sure that this, uh, the function respect, respect this identity if you uh, minimize this quantity. So you can then optimize what we, what we call a naive regular likelihood, that is essentially a log likelihood, minus this penalty on the CIMA with a regularization parameter. So we've shown, for example, in this paper that uh, this allows actually to uh, improve considerably the uh, identification of ground truth parameters uh, compared to maximum likelihood. So uh, let's now like switch to, uh, so yeah, actually we have some results that, that show that this approach uh, removes spurious solution and even like allows some identifiability results of the function. So uh, now let's connect it to uh, like classical Vanilla generative model, in particular variational autoencoders. So variational autoencoders are actually not uh, on top of this uh, forward pass to generate data, what they do is that uh, they uh, rely on an approximate rational posterity. This allows essentially uh, for complex model tractability of uh, the parameter inference at the cost of some approximation of the log likelihood. So essentially, you don't optimize the log likelihood. What you optimize is the evident lower bound on the likelihood, where essentially you have to subtract to the likelihood the k divergence 
between the true posterior of this model and the variational posterior that you estimate with this encoder deep neural network. So this is the decoder, the generative model, and this is the encoder. So the encoder essentially parameterizes like variances and means of Gaussians uh, for, for, for each value of x, the observation x. And uh, yeah, so this is essentially a highly constrained model of the posterior distribution given an observation point. So now, uh, uh, and I forgot to mention, like we make this model random uh, by uh, by adding some small isotropic motion noise in the observation. So that's the way to fit theta and phi at the same time. So now uh, let me uh, talk about like conflict views about the heat in the literature. So are they playing with non-identifiability? Because in a sense, they do. They aim to do maximum likelihood, but they don't do maximum likelihood, right? They, they do instead like elbow uh, maximization. So either like they perform something close to MNE, and that does, uh, in that case, they are struck by like the curve of uh, non-identifiability, or uh, the training. Uh, due to the elbow and uh, due to this gap, entails some implicit bias that allows identifiability of the parameter. So uh, we answer to this question essentially, and I make it short and conclude. Uh, but essentially, we answer this question by uh, looking at the elbow decomposition, uh, in particular, uh, looking at the optimum of the elbow decomposition for the optimal variational posterior. And the idea is, of course, like you want to, to take the optimal variational posterior in order to, to maximize the elbow. And uh, when you achieve this value that is achieved under, of course, like some, some, some constraint of like how strong is or universal is your encoder. Uh, if you achieve this, you reach the elbow star, that is the best elbow you can get for a particular uh, model parameter theta, for a model parameter theta. And uh, so the result that we have is that uh, under this condition, uh, let me go to the main result, the elbow star is equivalent in the low noise regime to a regularized maximum likelihood with the IME regularizer that I showed before. And this is asymptotically when this parameter gamma goes to infinity and this parameter essentially uh, the randomness of the, of the decoder. So to conclude this, uh, we have a connection here between like classical uh, training objective for generative models that a priori do not guarantee identifiability and an objective that guarantees identifiability, which is this IMA objective. And the regularizer that you get here is exactly the elbow gap. So the elbow gap is actually a good thing for us because it allows identifiability of uh, at least of a particular class of functions, the IMA class, uh, for the uh, true uh, the optimization of the VA. Uh, so I'm skipping to inside and I'm showing you like just some empirical results showing exactly this, like if you train essentially with the elbow, you're going to have that the gap between the likelihood and the elbow correspond essentially to this IMA loss. And this is uh, going to the right when the, the decoder becomes deterministic. So in the deterministic limit, we have a good match with the theory. And we have also like a good match with the interpretation of it is that if you go to this limit, uh, you also ensure like the ident like better identifiability of the ground truth factor. So this is the simulations, and MCC is a maximum maximum uh, correlation between the ground truth factor and the retrieve factors when you invert the fitting model. And clearly, the MCC makes a jump when you switch uh, to uh, uh, deterministic uh, VAs, like uh, when you get closer and closer to deterministic. 
All right, so there are also like uh, results on, for example, this price. But the take home is uh, exactly what I said, right? Is that uh, identifiability somehow is uh, allowed by this uh, implicit and inductive bias of the elbow. And this is a good news for us because it means that we can use uh, such vanilla uh, like learning algorithm uh, while we can have in the limit some identifiability gap. All right, so uh, just like to summarize overall, uh, applying, applying of the shape machine learning approaches to scientific uh, data is typically uh, not enough to contribute uh, like basic science. Uh, what you need is a lot of domain knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> and at the same time, uh, there's also one issue is that the minimal algorithm that you, you try to use to understand scientific data Many times they are not so, so well understood from the statistical perspective. This has been illustrated with the SVD, but it's also illustrated with what I just showed for the elbow, right? Uh, if you don't, 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 don't compute it, you don't, you don't see that the elbow has actually this implicit bias. Uh, so we can better essentially leverage scientific knowledge by looking at the interaction between mechanistic models and uh, machine learning alg algorithm. And uh, this essentially uh, can allow like uh, merging essentially data observed and computational models and uh, bridge causal machine learning with mechanistic models. So that's essentially the purpose. Clearly, this is not done. Uh, this is not done, but we are kind of scratching the surface by better understanding like implicit bias, biases of machine learning algorithm. And if we can like combine this knowledge with uh, like fitting properties of mechanistic model, we might achieve something great. And of uh, course, there's this connection to uh, like seem to real frameworks where you have some, some wrong models uh, that are essentially computational models that don't represent the reality exactly, that can be used to say something about reality if done right. And the, if this is the if done right, essentially, that we have to address with that being lost. Thank you very much. Um, we're on a bit short time, but we'll have to take one question. Does the audience have any questions? Okay, uh, we one uh, from the internet. Uh, so, we have a question from uh, Dr. Junio. And so, the question is uh, Is the measure presumably bad similar to isometric? Isometric? Uh, yeah, is the measure presumably no. bad similar to uh, you, you can use an algorithm because it's much broader than there, there are several uh, families of visual learning maps, and they are not necessarily available. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm going to ask a quick question. But, um, so, you basically, at the end there, you showed uh, this entire day, and but it was restricted to the class of these uh, components that you found with the ICA components. Uh, does that okay. like, put a really strict regularization on what you can generate? Does it like, restrict the fidelity of what you can reconstruct compared to, you know, like a tool? Yeah, so, a number as a, so do you mean like the, the AMA class is a, is a constraint? Yeah, theory, right? yeah. Uh, yeah, so we, we, we don't know from what constraint is this class. Uh, what we know is that a uh, subclass that is conformal maps, so physicists might be familiar with conformal maps, they actually preserve, preserve not only right angles between the components, but angles in general. And for conformal maps, of course, like this is uh, beyond three dimensions, this is a small family, clearly. So, of course, like, there is a trade off. We don't, know, we don't know how big is this family and uh, how much we can use it to like, fit in natural processes. But at the same time, we, we can think of some ideas where uh, you could adapt the representation of the natural process so that it's well aligned with this kind of assumption. That could be something, for example. Uh, and, uh, but of course, there is no free lunch. So you have to, you know, you have to accept that you have to put some constraint in order to, to, to be able to test it. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so once again, thank you. Thank you. Our uh, next talk, the next speaker, um, is also from uh, psychology and neuroscience.
Um, so uh, Dr. Christophe Dahl, who recently passed his uh, PhD, congratulations. Uh, he's going to talk to us um, uh, about uh, quantitatively uh, comparing predictive models with information theory and uh, 